Welcome to another morning on Chattavich Creek. A little later I will scan around here and show you that the edges of the creekers are frozen and it's about 30 something degrees right now but I'm dressed warm and uh, Marilyn is sitting over there with her winter coat on and the creek and the waterfall are frozen and looking beautiful today. The White Mountains are beautiful. We're going to start studying today the book of 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Nearly every book in the New Testament is written to a church. Written to a church. And this is no exception. Paul was at Corinth and he had a lot of love for those people at Corinth. They were ungodly buzzards, but God loved them and Paul loved them. And Paul is has written one letter to try to correct out heresies that they had. We, I'm glad that the Corinthian church had lots of problems because our churches today have a lot of those same problems today with the deity of Christ, with the person of Christ, with the person of God, with the commission. The commission is, is given to churches. Matthew 16 18. You are Peter. You are Petros, but upon this gigantic... Petra, foundation rock, I'll be building my church, and the gates of hell shall not wrestle her down. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. As you've been, after you've been kicked out into the world, make disciples. Make disciples. Make learners. Make habitual learners. Teaching them, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to guard with their lives all things that I've handed down with you. And lo, I'll be with you until the end of this age. Now, I'm reading from Spiral Zodiotes, a Hebrew Greek studying Bible. And I'm going to read the forward to you that he wrote concerning the letter of 2 Corinthians. Soon after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, there was a riot in Ephesus in Acts 19, 21-41. And there's where Paul... <clears throat> went and he started preaching and there was a temple of Artemis or Diana there and there were certain people that were making a lot of money off of making and selling these idols, icons to the goddess Diana or Artemis. They uh, gave him a hard time and beat him all up. If we go there to 1 Corinthians the 19th chapter or the Acts the 19th chapter that is I had it marked here. Acts the 19th chapter. Verse 21. We'll just read what happened here. Now after these things were finished, Paul uh, purposed in the spirit, in spirit, literally, to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent to Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. And about that time there arose an old small disturbance concerning the way, and that's what we call the Christian way, the road, the hodos. For a certain man, Demetrius, and his name Demetrius basically means Jimmy, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis or Diana, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business, whether it's right or wrong. Just think about that so many times as we look in the world today. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also almost all of Asia, this Paul was persuaded, has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that the gods made with hands are no gods at all. And not only is there a danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana, or Artemis, be regarded as worthless, as refuse. And that she whom all Asia and the world should, even being dethroned from her magnificence, and that, was, that temple was a fantastic, beautiful temple also. And they were very proud of this, the Greeks were, and the Romans. And when they heard this, they uh, kept on being filled with rage. And they kept on crying out, saying, Great is Artemis, the 
<coughs> of the Ephesians. And the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord to, into the theater, dragging Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions, from Macedonia. And Paul wanted to go into the assembly. Now, here we have the word assembly here. And uh, this is uh, this is daemon, daemo, damus, damus. This is a um, what we call a riot, a riotous assembly. Nicodemus was crowdbuster. This is the crowd right here, Damos. And the disciples would not let him, and also some of the us Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to intervene into the theater, or venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and others of the assembly, all right, was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what cause they had come together. And some of the crowd con concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motion with his hand, Alexander was intending to make offense for the assembly, or to the assembly. And when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them, all as they shouted for about two hours. Now, they see a Jew, and a Jew believes in what? One God. So now they have God. So now they're upset because this lawyer, this Jewish lawyer, is going to defend them, they think. And after quieting the multitude, the town clerk, the town clerk, who we have here, the, 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 the town clerk, this is a... These are the people that uh, are the bosses of the city. The registrar said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there among you after all who does not know that the city of Ephesians is a guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, Diana, and of the image which fell from heaven? Now here we have another. They worshipped asteroids that hit the earth. Now if you go to the Kaaba in Mecca, you're going to see another one of these asteroids being worshipped by the Muslims today. They go down there and they say that a man, the only way his sins can be forgiven is they go there on this pilgrim named this Hajj, and they go, these Muslims go there, and they march around this thing. They have to have pure white clothes, simple pure white clothes. They go there and they march around and say their, recite the Quran, the verses relating to this Hajj, and then they go touch the rock, and the rock absorbs all of their sins. This is what we call extreme idolatry. Extreme idolatry. Now here we have the same thing, and about the same time this happened in history. Same time as that rock asteroid hit in Me near Mecca. Here we have one over here that they're worshiping here. And. Uh, Verse 36 says, Then these are undeniable f facts. You ought to keep calm and to do nothing rash. For you have brought these men who are neither robbers of the temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then if Demetrius the craftsman who are with him have complained against any man, the courts are in session and the proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have, but if you want anything beyond this, it should be settled in a lawful assembly, in a lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's affair, since there is no real cause for it, and this connection we shall be able to account for this disorderly gathering. And after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. The assembly, okay? Now let's go back and look at the assembly in 1 Corinthians and read a little bit more about it. He said it had not been in Corinth for three, he, he had not been in Corinth for the last three years. The relationship between Paul and his converts in Corinth was strained during this period of time. It was a difficult period for both who, while separated, then during Paul's third missionary journey while develop, traveling into Macedonia, northern Greece, on his way to Corinth in Acacia, southern Greece, Paul encountered Titus and learned that his letter to the Corinthian brothers had accomplished much good in 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7. However, there were still some in the Corinth who denied that Paul was true apostle of Jesus. So now 
This letter is a defense of Paul's ministry and his apostleship and try to further correct the erroneous views and bad practices in that church, the practices of error in that church at Corinth. Paul decided to write them the next letter and send it on ahead with Titus before Paul arrived in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 2.13, 8, 1 through 6, 16, 17, and 9, 2 through 4 are cross references to this. Paul explained why the first letter had to be so severe, very severe. He suffered much as he waited for their reaction to be questioned by them. He stood ready to confront his accusers in 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 13, 1 through 4. He appealed to the brethren to help the starving Jewish Christians in Judea around Jerusalem. Paul did spend the next winter in Corinth in Acts 20, 2 and 3. He had planned in 1 Corinthians 16, 5 and 6. It was probably at that time that he wrote the Roman letter. The, Rome, the, the letter to the church at Rome, another church at Rome. Except for Paul's letter to Philemon, 2 Corinthians is the least systematic, doctrinal, and most personal letter that he ever wrote. Paul's intense emotion and fiery personality are revealed more clearly here than in any other of his epistles. It is a full of digressions and meanderings. He tells of some very personal experience such as his vision of the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. And that is where we have Paul's, had he died, Paul was killed when he was stoned to death. And of his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Throughout the letter there is a strong undercurrent of defensiveness. He's defending himself. He was being attacked and felt forced to justify his authority against false legalistic teachers who had meddled in his work. He warned the congregation, the assembly, against certain errors, instructed them in the matters of duty as Christians, and expressed his happiness that they had heeded what he had said in 1 Corinthians, and then he had to correct them further. But the real watchword of 2 Corinthians is what we must all be loyal to Christ, not to human personalities. We must all be loyal to Christ first and not to human personalities, not to our leaders, not to our teachers, not to our pastors, but to Christ first. Your pastor leads you astray. Don't go astray. If your teachers lead you astray, don't let them teach in churches. I taught in a... I preached in a beautiful scriptural Southern Baptist church uh, 10 years ago. I would go and preach to them very often. And I haven't been there for probably five or six years now. But they had a person come in out of the Jehovah Witness uh, brethren. They came in there and he began to teach that Jesus is a God, not the God of heaven. The church just scattered all over. That church, it was packed. When I'd preach it, I mean hardly another person could sit in there. They had the most beautiful song services. But the church fell apart because of heresy. Heresy. About the person of Jesus Christ. And that is one of the most important doctrines in the world. Now let's go here. We're going to look at this from Greek. I won't teach real heavy into the Greek language today, but I'll get into it a little bit in 2 Corinthians. This letter is by uh, Greek reading and research by induction. And I haven't done 2 Corinthians and I'm trying to get a lot of these things done while I'm on this earth. So I'm doing the Gospel of Mark also on Sunday night in Oildale at Valley Baptist Church and I'll be doing this uh, 2 Corinthians here in Nevada and in the uh, a little congregation that we have there in Old River also. Paulos Apostolos Christu Esu, Dia Thelamatos, Theu, Kai Thimotheus Hodel Delphos, Te Ecclesia, Tu Theu, Te Usen, En Corinthio, Sin Tois Agios Pasin Tois Usen, En Hole Te Achaia. Now, what that said, let's go back and look. 
Paul an apostle. Paulos. Uh, Paul's name was actually Saul. And Saul means one asked for. It comes from the same Hebrew word as Sheol, the place asked about. So Paul was a, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin where the first king of Israel was. That's Saul. Saul was named after the first king of Israel. He was of the same tribe as the king, King Saul was. So he had a pretty good lineage. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a zealot. He was of that group that uh, went out and killed Roman soldiers, the Stilet, the uh, Sicarii. He was that part, part of that group also. He was on the Sanhedrin court. He had to be married. He was a Pharisee. He was the leader of the Sanhedrin court. He was the administrator of the Sanhedrin court. When we find in Acts, the seventh chapter, where he had uh, the first stone cast against Stephen. And that was basically an unlawful assembly, too, because they did not have the authority to bring about the death penalty, capital punishment. So we have Paul in several places in the Bible. We have him as an outlaw. He called himself a ravenous wolf when his name was Saul. And then God called him on the road to Damascus, as you read in the book of Acts, and struck him down and blinded him and made a different man out of him and gave him a new name, which was Paul, which means little. He was a big shot in Judaism. Now he becomes a little shot, a little guy. Paul means little. Paulos Apostolos. The word apostle, apostolos, or apostle, means uh, one sent out with what we call kingly authority or divine authority. Here, the Lord used the word apostle when he called out his 12 apostles, and one of them was the devil. The first gift placed in the church, and the church was in existence before the day of Pentecost, the first gift placed in the church was apostles. Paul an apostle, Christu. Christu, that's genitive singular masculine. That means belonging to Christ. I belong to Christ. Now he has this Paulos Apostolos, that's a nominative singular masculine. And then we have Christu, that's genitive singular, ma singular masculine. It's belonging to Christ. And then we have the word Asu. Christ means the anointed one. The anointed one. The anointed Christ, Jesus. He's defining who he is. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus is Nazareth, the Hamashiach that was to come. Christo, the anointed one, Asus, means Jehovah saved. Jesus, and it's the same word as Joshua. Dia. Dia means uh, by the means of. By the means of. Dia, a little preposition. And then we have Thelamatos. That means the spiritual activating force. The spiritual activating force. We see in, in 1 Corinthians, the, or uh, Ephesians, the first chapter, he calls about, by the Thelamatos, by the spiritual activating force of God, we are called. And then he says here, the Thelamatos, the spiritual activating force, theu, belonging to God. Genesis, sing, genitive, singular, masculine again. And Timotheus. Timotheus. Remember what Timotheus means, uh, uh, Marilyn? Timotheus, Timio, one honorable, the honorable one. The honorable one. The brother, the brother, my brother, Timothy, my brother. You know, Timothy was kind of a shy guy. He was a, a little bit timid in some ways. And uh, Paul had to encourage him in, in his letters to Timothy. Uh, and that's how, how to behave in the house of God, too, First and Second Timothy. Timothy, the brother... Te Ecclesia. Te Ecclesia. That is uh, dative, singular, feminine. Definite article, Te and Ecclesia. The word Ecclesia comes from Ek and Kalio in Greek. It means one's called out. An assembly is not a church house. The assembly, or the church, is not the church house. The, the church is the assembly of people in the church house. That is the assembly. And that's what Paul's writing to here. We have another church letter in our midst. Another church letter. Te ecclesia to theu. The church belonging to God. Belonging to God. Now this is God's church. The little church that I pastor in Tehachapi, 
Highline Missionary Baptist Church, that's God's church. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to the church members. It belongs to the Lord. When I pastored uh, as an associate pastor in Valley Baptist Church for 20 years, that church doesn't belong to Roger Fradling or Phil Neighbors or anybody else. It belongs to the Lord. We need to remember those things. Sometimes churches get out of order, and sometimes they go astray. They forget what functions they are. I always tell Marilyn when I'm, I'm going to call my boss, I'm going to call my church, I'm going to call Ray and Carol and all of those up there, because they are my boss. I'm not my boss. They're my boss. I'm their servant. Pastors are servants of churches. They are not bosses of churches. Now, this, ma this man here, Paul, was called of God to be an apostle, and he had some very, very good doctrinal divine information for this ecclesia for this assembly the ecclesia to theo belonging to god it says to the ones being usen to the ones being in corinth being in corinth the ones being there this church is in corinth this assembly is in corinth with the saints and all the ones being in entire Achaia. Because these people came and were part of this assembly at times. They came and they spread out. What do churches do? What's the church supposed to do? Make disciples. Make disciples. And when you get the disciples made, you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to guard with their lives all things I have given unto you. Karis hamin kai arani aputhiu patros himon kai kurio esus Christu. Grace to you, grace, that's unmerited favor, amen, to you all. And arani. Arani is a beautiful word. In Bullinger, page 575, it talks about shalom, it talks about arani. It means the absolute opposite of confusion, it means order. It means comfort. It means peace. It means quiet. A rainy aputhiu. Peace, shalom. All oh, those in the Middle East, when you meet them, Jew or Jew or Arab, they'll say. Jew or Muslim, they'll say shalom. But shalom means one thing. It means agreement, not peace. If you don't have an agreement, you have no peace. We got to agree who God is before we can have peace, don't we? Really, in all reality, before we can have peace with God, we have to realize who He is and what He wants out of our lives and what He's done for us. And what He did for us is to send His Son, His only begotten Son, to be born in Bethlehem, to be raised in Nazareth, and to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the blind and cure the leopards raise the dead and all of these things were simply one thing proving that he is the Hamashiach the Messiah peace from God the Father God the Father of us I am so happy that I can call God my Father Jesus gives me the right by dying on the cross of Calvary to say Father when I pray Father thank you for what we have Father, thank you for all the blessings you give us. Father, I need this or I need that. Father, someone is sick. Can you see to that? Can you guide the doctors? Can you guide the, me guide the medicines? Make them not, help them not make mistakes because doctors make plenty of mistakes. And help them and raise them up again so they can serve you. There's no other reason why a person is raised up that, than other than that he is serving the Lord. God didn't leave you here for yourself. He left you here for the Lord. I love this beautiful country up here. Marilyn, you know that. Now you love it to some. Not like I do, but we love this country. We've been traipsing around up here. But this is what we call uh, getting a little life back in me. I feel 10 or 15 years younger when I'm up here. But when I'm up here, I have to take time to preach and feed God's people. And when I'm down there, I have to preach and feed God's people. I'm not living here for me. I'm living here for the Lord. That's why I try to take time out and 
and preach God's word wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. Because this is what God's calling to me is. This is God's calling. Eulogetos. All right. The Father of us and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The Father of us and the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter is, is written in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we're baptized in the name of Son, Son, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then it says down here in verse number three, Eulogetos, ho theos, kai pater tu, trio hemon, esus Christu, ho pater ton, oik trimon, oik termon, that is, kai theos, passes, paraclesios. Blessed. It means we, we have eulogies at funerals, don't we? Paul's given a eulogy here. This is the word, eulo, eulogetoto. Eulogetos. This is a eulogy. He's saying something good. He's blessing them. He's giving them a blessing. A eulogy. In verse number 3. Blessed the God. Ho theos. That's nominally singular masculine. Ho there is nominally singular masculine def definite article. Tohoris tohon our throne. The God. And the pater. And the father of the Lord of us. Our Lord. That, you know, it's very beautiful because Jesus is our Lord. When you've been born again, He is your Lord and you're His. We can call upon Him because He is our Savior. Our righteousness is in Christ Jesus. It's not in what we do. The Lord of us. Esu Christu, ho pater. It says, the Lord of us, Jesus Christ, the Father of the oik ter mon. The compassions, the household compa compassion, the compassion that you have for your children. If you've ever seen one of your children die, if you've ever seen their, their uh, in the hospital and held their hands as they were sick, if you've had a mother or father that was like that, you, this is the kind of compassion, the compassion, the love of the household, the love of your family, and the God of all Paraclesios. Here we have a little word, paraclesios. That word there means to walk alongside and comfort us. God does comfort us. He walks aside with us and comforts us. So many times, I don't feel very well at times. I didn't feel very well since I went back to Bakersfield for a while or to Old River. I, I didn't feel good when I went back there. I started coughing. And uh, it's taken me a little while to try to get over it up here to breathe clean air again. Yesterday I had a hard time with my heart and arrhythmia and everything. I said, well, Lord, you going to call me home up here? You going to call me home when I'm preaching on the creek? It's okay. I know where I'm going. Lord, our Lord comforts us. If you're a lost man, and you have those heart pains, those angina, pectoris pain. Boy, you better be worried because you may be, next, the next thought you may have is in hell, Hades. But a child of God, we get graduate. We graduate and we get to go up, 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 up into that third heaven where Paul talks about in this same letter later on. The compassion to the God of us, the God of all comfort. And then in verse number 4, let's look at verse number 4 in, in 2 Corinthians. Whole Para kalon, hemas epi pases, te thelipse, hemon es to dineste, hemas para kalain, tus en pase thelipse, dia tes para klesios, es para clu, para clu metha, hote hepo tu theu. Boy, he uses this word paraclete over and over again in different forms. He used it up here, and he says, in the God of all comfort. Now watch what he did. He just keeps playing on this word, paracleo. Paracleo. And then he said, the one comforting us. That's nominee, singular, mass, and present participle, appellate, active. He's comforting us all the time. All the time in everything that you have. I am so, I have been so dumbfounded how God has provided for us here to get this place. 
It's just dumbfounded me. One thing after another, this thing's fallen in place, and I wanted to get a place up here to where I didn't have to work, where I could go in there and just preach when it was cold, preach when it was windy. I was going to preach two messages yesterday, and I couldn't preach them because it was too windy, and I had no place to get in to preach. Right here on this creek, this is my little pulpit right here. This is my congregation of these squirrels and, and whatever's around here, and sometimes a fish watching me from the creek bed, the chipmunks, as the last sermon we got. And whoever shows up. Get to look up here, and Marilyn wanted me to turn this around so you could see the White Mountains in the background. Maybe I ought to shoot the thing backwards the other way sometimes. You can see the creek in that bowl. It's beautiful. God gave this to us. It's actually His. It's just loaning us to us. We just get to come up here. Comfort us upon all the affliction, all the pressures of life, all the pressures of life. I'm old now. I used to have a real good intellect and very good memory. I can't even remember when to go to church sometimes now. I was late Sunday, an hour late, because I was going to church on the wrong time. Constantly, my memory is failing me now. Even though I can preach Greek and all this kind of stuff, man alive, this getting old business and having these little metal TIAs and, and little strokes, it's sure my brains are just like a sieve now. It just goes in and out. But the Word of God is something that I, it, it's just in, it's indelibly in my, every cell in my body so I can roll this out. Even though I'm incapacitated in many ways, this is part of me. This is part of me, and this is what God has made in my life. I gave a little bit of my life to Him, studying His Word, and I try to teach it to others so that they can pass it on to those people. I tried to find faithful men who I can commit these things to. I made some mistakes in my life. I, I, I tried to be friends with some men that were not capable of carrying God's Word. I thought they were. But they weren't. But God tells me, and I keep on trying and trying and trying to teach people and to preach to them that are worthy of carrying the Word of God, that will be faithful in carrying out His Word. We have afflictions in this world. We have afflictions in people that, that afflict us and things that afflict us, disease that afflicts us, finances that afflicts us, sometimes children of God in the world. We call about the persecuted churches throughout the world, those people that assembly that is persecuted. We live in America today. This is Thanksgiving. I am thankful this day. I am thankful this day that I can come and preach on this creek without being shot at. So far, anyway. I've been poisoned. I've been shot at. I've been done everything in the world you can think of trying to get rid of me. But God has protected me through all those things. I should have died four years ago. I had so much arsenic and mer mercury poisoning in my system. That's why I shake so bad. It's destroyed my nervous system and my circulatory system. But I'm still here preaching. God gave me a little more time. And I'm thankful for it, and I try to be faithful to Him. When I don't preach, I feel terrible because I know why God left me here. I need to preach. The affliction of us belonging to us unto the our being able to be able. This uh, dynamite power that God gives us that this we can wade through any type of bullets and armor and fire and walk on fire and walk through fire in this world at times. Of us to comfort present and fictive active to comfort the ones in every affliction. Do you know people that are in affliction right now? I have I get on the radio in at, at, at the daytime and sometime at nighttime, and I preach all over the world. And people will send me emails, and they'll say, pray for me. I'm having trouble. Pray for me about this. Pray for me about that. And they'll get out there sometimes. One night when I came up here, I was so tired. I got on radio, radio about 8 o'clock, and people started coming in and started asking me Bible questions on the radio. I was on 75 meters on 39.13, and I was up... I didn't feel like it. I was up to 1 or 1.30 in the morning. But God provided an amplifier that they could hear my words. 
He provided the antenna, the tower was given to me that I could put up. We got the wire out there that was given to me. Gary Gibson gave me that wire many years ago. I'm using it up here as an antenna now. Making good use of God's stuff. They will not forget that three or four hour sermon that I preached that night on the radio. And people come and they write me emails. And if you see the guest book and discover the word with drjim.com, discover the word.com or sermonaudio.com slash ddw, you will see a lot of call signs behind them. People are listening. That, those websites started on ham radio. That's where it started. They asked me Bible questions. That's where it started. Sometimes we comfort people in their lives. They thank us for taking time for them. They'll call me. I'll, I'll give them my phone number, and they'll call me on, my, on the phone, and they say, Oh, Jim, I know you're so, uh, you're, you're so busy, but you took time for me. You took time for me. Why? It's why I'm in the world. They don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm paid by God. <laughs> He's my employer, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, whether I get paid or not. I am going to be doing that because he's my employer. I'm working for the Lord. I'm one of his little ecclesia, one of his little church members. I've even been honored to be a pastor of one of God's churches. Pastor, that's the most honorable thing that, that God can ever put your way is being the pastor of one of God's churches. The pastor, the overseer, Rue in, in Hebrew, episkopos. In Greek, you're watching over God's people. And when I talk to them, I spend time, sometimes I'm so tired, and people call me on the radio or on the uh, telephone, and I'll spend time with them. I'm wore out. I have something else. I've been stopped. I was focused on something, and I get sidetracked. And I say, thank you, Lord, for this sidetrack, because it is your will, and I'm doing your will to just for them to hear my voice, for me to hear their voices, to comfort them. Parakluometha. Again, 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 again. Here we see this word about four or five times already. We are comforted with God's word, and we comfort each other with God's word. Our toy, ourselves, by the agency of God. Hippo to you by the agency of God. Let's look at one more verse. Hotekathos perisu e ta pathemata tu Christu eis himas hutos dieth tu Christu perisi e kai he paraklesis himon. Here we use the word paraklesis, parakletio, parakalio one more time. Because, just as he overflows our cups and the sufferings belonging to Christ and to us, we suffer, if we suffer in this world, I hope you suffer because of what you are as a Christian. I hope you don't suffer. I hope you don't have to go to jail because you robbed a bank or you went and stole somebody's property. I hope that you didn't commit perjury in court or something like that. I hope that, that you're not guilty of these things and you're punished by the society. I hope if you're punished by society, it is because you have named the name of Christ. You named the name of Christ. The sufferings of Christ unto us, that's word ace, extension, limitation, thought of verbal action. Because of us, unto us, just as or just in the so same manner through Christ Jesus, he abounds also the comfort. As we have so many trials and tribulations, may your comfort from the Lord more abound, fill your cup and overflow. Even though you're going through these terrible tribulations and trials, may the comfort of God be greater than all of those trials and tribulations. If you're out there listening to this message in, in China, in Russia, Bangladesh, 
India, France, Germany, United Kingdom. Now I'm naming all these things because they, they let, download these messages in all those places. If you're in that place and you haven't heard the gospel, you heard the gospel today. Jesus came and died for your sins. He came and took your sins upon him. You don't have to go to the Kaaba. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to anybody to confess your sins. You go to Jesus. You don't have to go to Mary either. You go to Jesus and say, God, forgive me because of what Jesus said. And Jesus did. He said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, In me you'll have peace, and you'll have it abundantly. I give you peace. They bind great burdens upon you that they wouldn't lift with one little finger. But I give you peace. You can have the peace if you believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son, that he came and became flesh and dwelt among mankind, died on the cross for your sins, was raised the third day, raised for your justification. You ask him and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and my shortcomings. Help me to serve you the best I can the rest of my life. Help me to know your word. Help me to glorify you with my life now that I'm yours. And if you're out there and you're saved in some place, go to church. Find one. Start one if you have to. Go to church. Serve the Lord. Father, we come to you with your word. We, we cast it out upon the waters. We ask that we know that you will honor it and you will bless it as you go. Forgive me, uh, for I have short, fallen short. Forgive me of my sins and my shortcomings. Forgive us for your failure. Let your word be honored. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.